the, the key the key to getting revelation right and this is really important is we need to we need to really understand the context of the book of revelation we've really got to understand the background to the book of revelation and some fundamental questions about the book in order for us to get it right one of the real dangers that a lot of people have when it comes to their struggle to understand the book of revelation has been that they've struggled to get some of the fundamental questions right when it comes to reading the book and if you get the fundamental questions wrong then that greatly Im impacts their ability to understand the book of revelation um it's like any other genre of literature in life if if okay. we or any medium of communication if we get the the genre the fundamental questions wrong we will misunderstand it and it's like if you pick up a children's book and you read a children's book and then you try to understand what is being said in the children's book in light of real events in the world around you you're going to get things pretty fundamentally wrong imagine imagine picking up um say uh, you know a children's story like um i don't know like anything like humpty dumpty or you know the story of hansel and gretel and, and whatever it is and misunderstanding fundamental questions about the the world in which you're stepping into then of course you're going to misunderstand that imagine picking up you know the lion the witch in the wardrobe c.s lewis's you know uh, chronic narnia series and misunderstanding the fundamental questions about it it'll greatly impact how you understand the world imagine thinking that there were uh places in the world and sort of wizards and all those sorts of things um, you've got to get the fundamental genre right and the same is when it comes to reading a newspaper or watching a, a television documentary you got to, we've got to understand fundamental questions about what is being communicated and that is true in the bible as well that doesn't change in the bible whether we're reading the gospels or we're reading the book of revelation or we're reading um, paul's letters it's always essential that we pick up the book and ask fundamental questions about it so what is what is the issue with revelation why is it causing so much uh difficulty um it, it's almost like with the book of revelation that we're going into the unknown so to speak and if i had to give a bit of a, a nickname or a series for this this particular study in revelation you know i would call it into the unknown um and with a book like revelation it's so tempting for us to actually ignore a book like revelation because we struggle to understand it um but the important thing to know is that as second timothy 3 16 says you know I, I call it the other important 3 16 verse we've got john 3 16 which everybody knows but the other one which i think is really important is second timothy 3 16 which says all scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching correcting and rebuking and training in righteousness that revelation is there for a reason uh, you know, God, um, the Spirit inspired it for a reason. If if God didn't want us to learn from this book, he wouldn't have given us this book. And, you know, the earliest Christians really took advantage and really appreciated Revelation. And it's something that we should also appreciate here today. And that's And that's why I feel like for so many Christians who struggle with this book and who struggle with end times theology, it's so important that we actually set aside time to studying it. And I, I think the fact that, you know, you're here today or, um, you know, the people that were there last week and those that will come regularly to Parkside Thursday, I think you can agree. And that's why um, you're obviously here. But the other thing which I think is really important is that revelation is the gospel. It's part of the gospel. Um, you know, as, as well as we might understand Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, <laughs> revelation is part of the gospel. You know, people often call um, Paul's letter to the Romans, the book of Romans, they often call that the theological gospel. Because the four Gospels that we do have, they they tell the story of the good news of Jesus. But then Paul in Romans really theologically unpacks the good news and what it actually means. But Revelation is part of the Gospel. It, 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 it's, it's telling us the Gospel story from a unique perspective. And I think as, we, as you go by week by week, you're going to see that. Essentially what Revelation is talking about is the victory of God. It's talking about how Christ is victorious over all the evil forces in this universe and how we, by becoming and attaching ourselves to the people of God and remaining faithful, you know, we we are part of that gospel and that good news. So revelation is not bad news. Revelation is good news. It's great news. It's as good news as any other part of the New Testament, which is why we're missing out if we don't take time to actually study it. And as I've said, um, you know, I, I've really tried to promise big 
when it comes to our study in the book of Revelation, because I, I really believe that people are going to be blessed by this study. I really believe that God is going to use this study to help people have confidence in understanding the scriptures. And I just want to encourage you here today. And this is probably our first marker, I guess, of application when it comes to this study. Although we're a study which is primarily focused on teaching the Bible, um, we want to also encourage people to apply God's word. And the first, I guess, marker of application that I want us to know here today is that there isn't an area of scripture that any of us should shy away from. You know, there's there's all scripture is there for our benefit. And whether it's a, a difficult book like Revelation or a book like Leviticus or whatever it is, we should all approach every single aspect of the Bible with confidence because it's there for our benefit, that God has given it to us, that all of the characteristics about our father that we know, our, our loving father, a father who cares for us, who wants to shepherd us, he is doing it through his word. And and sometimes the way that God shepherds us is through dealing with difficult um, and challenging passages of scripture. And that's what I think we should in encourage ourselves with when it comes to a book like Revelation. Um, at, at any point, if you want to ask any questions or you want to stop me, just feel free to uh, interrupt. There's a, a chat section there which you can put in any comments if you don't want to ask uh, questions verbally. But the, the difficult thing with the book of Revelation, I, I think, is that Revelation, or at least our, our real modern understanding of the book of Revelation, has been the waters have been muddied by popular culture. Now, the church, don't get me wrong, the church has always struggled with the book of Revelation. It's not always been an easy book for the church to understand. But especially in the last, um, you know, 50 to 60 years, it's been incrementally more challenging because pop culture has presented uh, a certain view of Revelation and a certain view of the end times that has led people to have all sorts of uh, preconditioned understandings when it comes to the book of Revelation. And some of those books, which some of you may have seen, or you maybe you've even come across these books, are things like the Left Behind series, which was very popular for many decades, the late great planet Earth books and the like. This little uh, picture here, uh, Doomsday Preppers, was a, a popular TV show, a sort of entertainment TV show, which uh, I'm not sure if it's still being produced, but it was there for a while, which was it was actually quite an enjoyable series. I watched a number of episodes of it and I always found it entertaining, but it was basically uh, following the lives or chronicling the lives of different people who were preparing for the end times. You know, they believed for whatever reason that the world was coming to an end and that they needed to prepare for it when it comes to things like storing canned goods and doing all of those sorts of things, right? But look, at the end of the day, um, when we look at the victory of God and Christ's second coming and Christ's return, I, I think the reality is when it comes to the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, the only things that we really need to do to prepare for Jesus coming is not about storing canned goods and doing all of those sorts of things, but it's actually getting right with the Lord, making sure that we have put our trust in the Lord and making sure that we are, as the Bible says, continuing to work out our salvation and that we as followers of Christ are getting on with the job of preaching the good news of salvation. And, you know, I will challenge preconceived ideas that people have when it comes to the book of Revelation. And, and there will be times that will challenge maybe some of the things that we've heard or things that we've been taught growing up. And it's not, it's not that we have to accept, it's not that everybody has to accept everything that I say in, in this study, that I always encourage people that we've got to test everything that I say, because I'm, you know, the word of God is perfect. The word of God is infallible. I, I'm not. And, and that's true for all of us, that our interpretations are not perfect. God's word is perfect, but our interpretations are not always perfect. And that's why, I'll, you know, I'll challenge some of these things when we get, especially other, when we get to later sections of, of the book of Revelation, I'll, I'll challenge some of the existing views that people have and try to present a biblical case and say, well, why do, you know, why do I think that these things are not correct? Um, and, and why do I think that it's like this? But, you know, we know, nobody ever has to agree and we're free to also uh, disagree. And sometimes healthy disagreement is, is very important. Um, but, um, you know, I think when it comes to the book of Revelation, one of the big issues that we have is because of the way that it's being popularized in, in, you know, parts of the world, especially in parts like of the world, like America, where, you know, Christianity and politics tend to get integrated, um, you know, that they tend to become one almost. Uh, what you tend to find is that churches either ignore revelation completely they either don't spend much time looking at the book of revelation at all 
or they overemphasize the book of Revelation where everything they teach Bible, is really about, Here about are the nine from um, Bible. end time. Everything that they teach is really about uh, end times theology and the like. Um, and, and often you'll see the dangerous thing that some churches do is they, when they do approach the book of Revelation, they often just approach sections of it, like say the first couple of sections, um, which are which are not as controversial and they skip the rest. But what I want to say to everyone today is that most of the book of Revelation is not controversial. You know, most of it is pretty straightforward when we apply good biblical analysis to it and we try to read it as the early Christians read it. And most of it is not controversial. There are some debatable subjects where we can debate and we can discuss, but most of it is pretty straightforward when we when we get the lens right with the book of Revelation. If we approach it in the correct manner, most of it is actually understandable and things that we can, we can relate to. And I think as we go through this series, I want to encourage you that the one thing I'm going to try doing, and I hope I can do it effectively, and you'll have to be the judge of this, is I hope I can take the complex and reduce it down to what is simple because i think that's always important when it comes to any any study of god's word or any study in that matter is if we can take complex things and break them down to what is simple and what is something that makes sense we'll we'll then know that we're on the right path we'll then know that uh we're actually in line with god's teaching when we tend to fall away from what is what is authentic biblical teaching it's when we it's when we try to overcomplicate things and we don't actually break them down. So I, I hope that I can I can achieve that effectively. Um, but can I just pause there and just say, are, are there any questions that anybody has or any comments that you want to make at this point? You can ask a question if you want, or you can just make a comment if you want. There's nothing uh, off limits. Okay, no worries. Okay. Okay. okay, so the first fundamental questions, and, and we're only going to get through the first four verses of the book of revelation and i you know i know um it's not we, we're not going to be able to go through chapter by chapter each week we'll have to break down chapters into maybe a couple of weeks but what we're going to see is is that today i'm just trying to get the main content of, out of the book of revelation as to sort of what are the fundamental questions about it but what i want to begin with begin with is this idea of you know, let's ask some fundamental questions. And the first four verses of the book of Revelation actually tells us a lot about the fundamentals of the book of Revelation. Now, uh, could somebody read the first four verses for us? Uh, if you've got your Bible, I've also got it there on the screen. But if, would somebody be open to reading it for us? The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants who must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Because the time is near, John. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, America. So we can see in those first four verses, we actually get a really good snapshot into some fundamental questions about what Revelation is. We, we're told the content. The content is that this is the revelation from Jesus Christ. And the phrase, the first sentence, the revelation from Jesus Christ, could be interpreted one of two ways. It could be either to say the revelation from Jesus Christ, as if Jesus himself is giving this revelation, or it could also be the revelation of Jesus Christ, that in other words, that Jesus is the content of what is being revealed. But the point is, is that the, the content of what is going on is this idea that the story that we're being told is the story of Jesus. It's of Jesus. So the content of the book of Revelation, fundamentally, we've got to understand is it is about Jesus. It is about Jesus and what he is going to do. Just like the Gospels were about the story of Jesus and how he dies for our sins and that he's raised from the dead so that we can have, you know, reconciliation with God, eternal reconciliation. Well, the book of Revelation, the content of the book of Revelation is about Jesus. And it's about who Jesus is. So often when we, we go on details about, you know, what is going to happen, 
you know, what are the things that are going to happen, you know, in the end times. It's important to always remember that at this fundamental question is about Jesus. It's not about the actual events that, that are involved in the end times. It's about Jesus. The second thing that we're told is the author. We're given a window into who the author is, and, and this is John. And I'm going to talk a bit more about the author in a little bit, in a little bit. But but we're told the author. We're also told the audience. The audience is told to us in the first four verses. We're told that it goes to the the seven churches of the province of Asia. Now the Romans divided their empire into a whole lot of provinces. Uh, provinces. One of these provinces was what they called Asia. In it, it was actually it's not what we think of when we think about modern day Asia, but it was the province of Asia, which is which was which was the region of um, eastern Turkey. So if you look at a map today and you look at eastern Turkey, what is known as Asia Minor, there were seven. There were a number of major cities in this region, but there were seven main cities in this region to whom this book was written to. And I'm going to pull up a map here um for you but when we look at uh where is it here okay okay when we look at this map who was revelation written to we notice in in this region of of, of turkey john is I, I couldn't get a, a map that shows both clearly but can you see on the map on the left the smaller map you can see ephesus here on this map and you can see a small little island off the coast it's it's about 60 kilometers off the coast Patmos, can you see sort of where I've got my my cursor? My cursor come up on screen. I don't know if it comes up um, uh, on screen, but I think uh, I can't. Comes around. So, can you see on the the map on the left? You've got it says Greek islands, and it's got the word Patmos there. Uh, yeah, I can't quite see it. No. Uh, not not on the I big map. So. The big map that says they're not on the big map that says Turkey. The the smaller one that says. Uh, um, yeah, oh, I can see. Yes. Yeah, it's got Patmos. This is yeah. where John is. John is exiled on Patmos at this particular point. And we'll talk a bit about that next week, but or tomorrow rather. But John is exiled on Patmos when when this letter, when he when he sends out, when the book of Revelation comes to him and he sends it out. But the intended audience are now. If you look at the big map, you can see you've got. Uh, Ephesus, you've got Smyrna, you've got seven uh, red markings on that. Everyone can see that. Yeah. Yes. We've got we've got Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamum. It's called Pergamos on the map, but uh, that's more of a modern name. Pergamon, uh, Tyathira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the seven churches who the letter is directed at. These are the letter. This is the letter, and. If you can imagine, the letter would get sent from John from Patmos, where he's exiled. It will get sent across into Asia Minor, into the province of Asia, and then you can sort of see that you've got the you've got the coastline. You've got Smyrna, you got Ephesus and Smyrna on on the coast, and the boats would have docked in Ephesus because it was a it was a major trading port, most likely. And then the trade route. If if you you imagine that. If you're a messenger, there's no email, there's nothing like that. If you're a messenger, you're going to go where? You're going to go Ephesus first with this letter, with the book of Revelation. Then you're going to go north to Smyrna, and you're going to follow the trading and the road the road routes, and then you're going to go to Pergamon up north. Then you're going to come down to Tyathira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And if you look at chapters 2 and 3, which are primarily directed at these churches, they go in that order. So chapter two begins with Ephesus, then it goes to Smyrna, then chapter three, Pergamon, Tythera. So it follows the order of a mailing route. And this is the intended audience. And, and as we go through chapters two and three in a couple of weeks time, I'm going to um, show us a bit. I'm going to show us, um, talk a bit more about what was going on in those particular churches. So we, we know in these first four verses, we know the content. We know the author and we know the audience. Now, of course, as the, as the people of God today, we are the audience. But an important rule now to always understand when it comes to scripture is this. And it doesn't matter what book of the Bible you're, you're reading. The first questions that we always want to ask is this. What did this passage mean to the original hearers? 
What did it mean to the original hearers? What did they think that these things meant? Then we ask secondary questions about what it means for us or what we call application. So a good study of God's word never jumps straight to application. It always starts off with, with what did it mean to the original audience? When the original audience heard all oh, the seven churches of the province of Asia, they weren't thinking in modern terms like, oh, okay, well, maybe that's India, maybe that's China, maybe that's um, you know Sri Lanka, uh, maybe that's Japan. No, no, they, they knew that these were cities um, that John was sending the letter to. So it's important to keep that in mind. Are, are there any are there any questions? Questions there? Any questions so far? No. Okay. Um, so the second thing, uh, the next thing that we want to want to know uh, about the Book of Revelation. Well, the next thing we want to talk about is is a very important thing. One of the most fundamental questions about the Book of Revelation. If we get this question, if we get this wrong then we'll get the rest of the book of Revelation wrong. But what is the genre? What is the genre of the book of Revelation? Because genre matters. As I said, the way you and I interpret a newspaper article is very different to how we interpret a children's book. How we interpret a cartoon or how we interpret a movie is very different to how we interpret real life. So that's fundamentally important when it comes to Revelation. And fortunately, the book of Revelation doesn't actually leave us guessing as to what its genre is. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. When we talk about, as I mentioned, when I, when I, when I said before that, there's a lot in the book of Revelation that is not controversial and its genre is not controversial. People that have studied the book of Revelation are scholars and they're like, nobody really disagrees with the genre of the book of Revelation. They accept that it is apocalyptic literature. And how do we know that it's apocalyptic literature? Because of the very first verse in the, in the book. We know that the Gospels are but ancient biographies about the life of Jesus. We know that the book of Psalms is a collection of songs, poems, and prayers. We know that Paul's letters are epistles. That is their genre, their letters. So Revelation is apocalyptic literature. The first line, the revelation from Jesus Christ, that word revelation in the Greek is uh, apocalyp uh, uh, apocalypsis, apocalypsis is what it means in the Greek, apocalypse. And the word actually means to pull back the curtain. It means to unveil or to reveal. So the apocalypse would be, imagine me me pulling back, pulling back the, the blinds or, or opening a shutter so that you could see what is behind. You know, on the stage when you go to theatre, how you've got a big curtain which blocks your view and then, all of a sudden, the curtain is pulled back. The word revelation is like pulling back a curtain. It means in the original language, unveiled or to pull back the curtain. So that is the genre of apocalyptic literature. But but how did apocalyptic literature work? Is it like um, a historical narrative? Is it a song? What is it? Well, apocalyptic literature is a genre of spiritual writing which was very common, which was very common during the intertestamental periods. Now, what do I mean by the intertestamental periods? In the in the few hundred years, really between the end of the Old Testament, so the Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi, and then there's about 300 years, a 300 year gap before Jesus comes onto the scene. And it was a it was a genre of literature that really developed prolifically during this time but it was there beforehand there are sections of the book of joel zechariah isaiah which which um and even um ezekiel which actually bring in this 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 genre of literature but it is especially most notably known for the second half of the book of daniel so if you read the book of daniel it's really divided into two parts chapters one to six is narrative about Daniel's life and certain things that happen and some visions. But then you've got um, chapters, chapters 7 to 12, which is which are apocalyptic literature. So what is 
apocalyptic literature. It isn't a genre of literature that we are used to today. You know, we're used to fictional narratives, nonfiction, television reports, social media and the like. But apocalyptic literature was a genre of spiritual writing which employed vivid images, language and symbolism to depict God's unfolding cosmic plans with reference to earthly and heavenly perspectives. So what do I mean by that? Well, the book of Revelation, as we read it, we will see it has a lot of vivid images. It has a lot of explosive language and a lot of symbolism. And the key for us is to understand that those vivid images and that language and the symbolism and to then interpret what it means effectively. So imagine if you if you were to watch a Hollywood blockbuster, right? What do you what are some of the features of a Hollywood blockbuster? Well, there's there's a narrative, but then there's also you know explosions, there's also gunfire, there are all of these things. And you and I suspend our reality and we step into that world and we understand what those things mean. When you know you watch, say, like the James Bond franchise, and you look at a, a bad guy with his with his, a villain with this sinister plot, you and I don't walk away from the movie thinking, "Oh my goodness, there's actually somebody out there who's trying to end the world." We understand that it's fiction, and when we see like car crashes and the like, or or, or people killed, we don't we realize that it's it's fictitious. We're not expecting to watch the news and, and to see these things. Well, the Book of Revelation employs vivid language and vivid imagery and symbolism in order to communicate its point. That's what apocalyptic literature did. So we can't read Revelation the same way we read uh, the Gospels or the same way we read Paul's letters. We've got to understand and correctly interpret that those images correctly if we want to understand what the meaning of Revelation is all about. And this is what people often get um, confused with when it comes to revelation they they misunderstand the, the symbolism and the vivid imagery and that causes them to misinterpret what revelation is all about um and, and the important thing to know is that these this vivid imagery is told as we read the book of revelation this will all make sense it's told from a variety of perspectives sometimes it's told from an earthly perspective sometimes it's told from a, a heavenly perspective but it, the book of Revelation combines these two perspectives together. Now, I want to pause there just to say, are there any questions or any comments that people want to make? Because this is a really important point. Yeah, it's good what you said just then, because if you see a car accident, you got different people seeing it from different angles and have a different perspective on what mm -hmm. happened in that car accident. Mm -hmm. So like you say, it's from a heavenly and an earthly perspective mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so i think you're going to see those things unfolded and, and just coming back to that car crash met in the analogy again it's like the car crash you see on real life if you see a, a car crash in real life and you see a car crash on television how you respond to those two things are different different right when you see it on television you don't immediately jump up and call the police and, and, and try to get help for the people there but when you see a car crash in real life you respond and you try to help out well Revelation is the same. We've got to understand that the genre of Revelation is like an ancient Hollywood blockbuster. It's it's showing vivid images for a point. So you know, we, and we're going to see that as the story unfolds. But yeah, thank you, Mary. Any other any other questions or any comments people want to make? When when, when nobody uh, says anything or has any comments, I assume that you're you're able to follow and you're understanding what I'm saying and things like that. If you don't understand or anything like that i you can just let me know and i can re-explain it and try to be a bit bit more thorough but but when you know there's no comments or questions i just assume everybody's um understands what's going on there um okay so what is the, what is the problem with revelation you know there's nothing that i've, I've said so far which 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 bothers people, you know. People understand. Oh yeah, Jason, I, I get that. There's an audience. There's an author. There's a there's 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 a content. There's it's apocalyptic literature. There's visions. There's all these explosive imagery. You know, I get that. You know. So why then is there an issue of studying the Book of Revelation? Why is there a problem studying the the uh, apocalypsis of Jesus? What what is going on? Well, it's really because of two fundamental questions, and they both surface in the first few verses. The revelation 
of Jesus Christ or the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So it's two things. It's the dilemma is two questions. How soon and what will take place? How soon and what will take place? Now, the rest of the rest of this study in the book of Revelation, Matthew took us uh, over a year. Matthew took us over a year, 28 chapters. Revelation could take us the same time. It's only 22 chapters. It could take us less. I, I just don't know. But I, I won't speed through it. But the rest of this study in the book of Revelation will be about the second question. What will take place? This this particular study will be about answering the first dilemma. How soon? Because that's that's the, the big issue that a lot of people have with Revelation. It's it's you know, are we living in the end times? Is Jesus going to return tomorrow? Are the things happening in this world, the political things, you know, Ukraine, uh, natural disasters when we see it, politicians that rise up, you know, the Second World War, you know, are these the things that will take place? You know, we, we debate those things, but but the question of how soon, Revelation actually doesn't leave us guessing with this question. This is an important thing to try to get right. So please, <clears throat> if I don't explain this properly, you got you got to stop me. The Greek word for soon. The Greek word for soon, what must soon take place, is a very important word. So for us, it appears twice in this particular section, it, it, well, twice of concern in the book of Revelation. The Greek word is a, a tricky word. So it appears here, what must soon take place, and also in Revelation 22, verse 20, where Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon. Yes, I'm coming soon. It's a tricky word to get right. It's a very explosive term. And it's an important term to get right, because if we get this term right, we won't speculate anymore about the soonness of Jesus' return. The Greek word is the word takos. Just think of the word tako, takos. It means quickness, speedily, hastily, immediately, or without delay or imminently. So in the original language, it refers to something which is going to happen immediately, immediately. And when we see it in other parts of scripture, it refers to that same truth. So it's really, really important. And I, I want to be just really, really fair to God's word. It's very, very important that we are not intellectually dishonest. There, there are people that sort of say, oh, you know, the things in Revelation are still to come. They're going to happen in, you know, a thousand years time or they're happening today, this, that and the other. But remember what I said. I said that the first tool to understanding God's word, the first rule to understanding this God's word is how, how did the early, earliest readers understand this word how did they understand it so when they they heard this word takos or taku how would they have understood this well they would have understood this as assuming that the things that the book of revelation is talking about are things which are going to happen in their lifetime or in the generations after their lifetime they're going to happen soon they're not going to be things that are going to happen two thousand years down the line now just just a just a, a quick example to prove what i'm saying here right that in in Luke's gospel, chapter 15, we have a, a famous story of the prodigal son. And you remember in that story of the prodigal son where the prodigal son leaves and the prodigal son comes back. And when the, when the prodigal son comes back, this is what the father says to his servants. He says, he says to, the father said to his servants in, in Luke 15, verse 22, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now, when the father says, quickly go and grab the robe and put it on him, that is the same word here when Jesus says the things that will soon take place. End of revelation. Yes, I'm coming soon. Quick, he says. Now, now, would, would the servants hearing that assume that the master who was instructing them to bring the robe and put it on this son who has returned having 
in protocol for so long? Would they have assumed, oh, well, he, he's just saying do it in you know a few years' time or in a few weeks' time? No, what would they have assumed? Quickly means do it straight away. Do it straight away. So the natural reading of this is the things are soon going to happen. That, yes, I'm coming soon, says Jesus. Yes, I'm showing this thing to my to my followers so that they will know what is soon to take place and they can act accordingly. And just that final little point I have there is that note that the book of Revelation clearly has sections which have already been fulfilled. There's no way around it. You know, we can't just say, oh, the book of Revelation is about things which are happening in our day or in years to come. The book of Revelation has things which have been fulfilled. And the earliest readers of Revelation would have assumed that they were living in the end times, just like you and I assume that today. You know, just like we assume that the things happening in the world around us are a symbol that Christ is coming soon or that he can come imminently. So, so here's the problem, though. If these things are coming soon, why is it that Jesus has not yet come? Why is it that Jesus hasn't yet returned? You know, the book of Revelation ends with, with Revelation 22, the idea of the, the new Jerusalem, Eden being restored and there being no more crying, suffering or, or pain, you know, evil being done away with us in, in perfection. So if Jesus said 2,000 years ago that these things are coming soon and, yes, I'm coming soon, well, the, the problem that we have is, well, why why haven't these things happened yet? Why are we still waiting? And it's because of this reason. Two really important things. There's a difference, and, and often we don't we don't realize this, but there's an important difference between Jesus when he says, I'm coming soon, and Jesus' second coming. That's probably a distinction that many of you may never have heard or thought about before. Or maybe you have, and that's fantastic. But stick with me here because this is important. When we read in the book of Revelation, Jesus saying, yes, I'm coming soon. Our assumption is that what he is saying is I am returning soon to judge the world. And I'm going to and you bring in this new um, this new kingdom. It's what we think of when we think about the end times. Jesus is second coming. He's going to just like he came at Christmas, he's going to come again. And this time when he comes, it's all of the wonderful things that we've been promised where we're going to have re resurrected bodies and, and God is going to put everything right. But but here's the thing. that is that what Jesus means when he says, yes, I'm coming soon? Of course, there is a day, and the Bible makes this clear, when Jesus will come again and everything will be put right. But when he says, yes, I'm coming soon, is that actually what he is? he talking about his second coming or is he talking about a coming which is very different? What is he talking about? Well, what Jesus is talking about when he says, yes, I'm coming soon, is something which is actually really powerful. And this is how I believe the early church would have understood his words, is that the coming of Jesus is the coming of the kingdom. The coming of the kingdom. Do you remember what, what Jesus said when he was on earth? He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near, or the kingdom of God is close at hand. And he said to the disciples that if I'm in your presence, the kingdom of the Lord has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. So when Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he is talking about the advancement of his kingdom. And what is the advancement of God's kingdom? It is the work that God is doing in the world through the church and through his people. When you and I come into this world and proclaim God's coming, when we proclaim his kingdom is coming on earth as it is in heaven, when we preach the gospel to people, that is Jesus coming. Have you ever thought about that before? When Jesus sent his disciples into the world to preach the gospel, that is the kingdom of God coming. And where the kingdom of God is coming, there the king is coming. So what Jesus says to his church is that, yes, I am coming soon, as in my kingdom is coming soon. And the events of Revelation are coming. 
And how are the events of this book being fulfilled? They are being fulfilled in that time and in the generation of the book of that the book of Revelation was was released to the public, and in the two thousand odd years that have followed since, that Jesus is coming through us, the church, and the culmination of this coming will be one day when Jesus returns in the flesh, and as the Bible says, that as lightning is visible in the as lightning in the East is also visible in the West, so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. That day will come when there will be a completeness where Jesus will return in the flesh. And as the Bible predicts, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and the graves will be opened up and we will be given, we will be given resurrected bodies. That will be the completion. But Jesus has come. You know, that's why at Christmas time we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. The Lord has come. Jesus didn't go anywhere. Here's the thing, that that Jesus, when he returned to the Father, he didn't leave us, the Bible says. He sent the Spirit to be with us. And what does he say? I am with you until the ends of this age. So he hasn't gone anywhere. He's with us. His kingdom is coming. So when he warned John and the followers that, yes, I'm coming soon, or these things are coming soon, He's not talking necessarily about his second coming, although that is part of what he's saying, but he's talking about the fact that his kingdom is coming and he's bringing it in. And how the early church would have understood that is that the events that happened in the first century, like the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, like the persecution that that gripped the early church, these were all signs that Jesus, that Jesus' kingdom was coming. And that is true for us today. When we see wars and rumors of wars, when we see uh, evil in this world, it is all a symbol that the world is broken, that God is fixing it, and that it's coming. A day is coming when the New Jerusalem will be restored. Does that does that sort of like is that is that sort of clear to everyone? Does that make sense? Yep. 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 And, and this and this is the thing about that word taku is it conveys this word of immediacy without delay, but it does so in a very clever way. It's a very rhetorical word. So it's a word that means things that are going to happen quickly. They're going to happen in a, in a quick fashion. There's an immediacy about it, but it doesn't actually put a time frame on it. So what do I mean by that? Well, I say, I, I describe it like this. There is no perfect English translation for this word. But if I said to you that I will see my lost relative soon, right? The word soon in that sentence conveys an immediacy. You know, it's something which is going to happen soon. I want to convey that urgency of how it's going to happen. But it's not to put a time frame sense on it. Does that make sense? So my father passed away when I was 20 years old, when I was 19 years old, going on 20. If I said, I will see my father one day soon, you know that rhetoric, the word rhetorical, the word soon in that sentence functions rhetorically. I'm putting an immediacy on the fact that I will see him again one day without, without conveying a sense of, oh, but it's going to happen tomorrow or today. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And and if, if, if I was to, so when Jesus says, yes, I am coming soon, he's saying, I am coming immediately without delay. Nothing is going to halt the fulfillment of God's plans. That's what he's saying. So when he says, yes, I'm coming soon, or in this, this first, the first few verses that the things are soon to take place, he's saying to them that the plans of God, the kingdom of God, which is coming, is coming and nothing can stop it. Nothing can delay it. So for 2,000 years, the kingdom of God has not been delayed. As Paul, as Peter says, that the Lord is not slow to come such that he wants everybody to come to repentance. It's the plans of God since day dot, they have been fulfilled. And in the fullness of time, the completion will happen. That's why Jesus said, keep watch therefore, if you do not know the day or the hour your Lord will return. It's this idea that the kingdom of God is coming. It's coming. And we are just waiting for the eventual day when God says, now everything is completely ready. Now is the time. Does that make sense? To everybody yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes yes so one thing which is important about the book of revelation 
is that revelation is not a license to speculate about the actual day of Jesus' return. Nobody should ever say Jesus is going to return on this date. This is the date he's coming back. I've got it marked down. People have tried to do that. You know what's so funny about that thing is that Jesus settled that debate. He made it clear in, in Matthew's gospel when they asked him, when is it going to happen? He said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Well, what is he saying? He's saying the father knows and he is the one that's going to dictate when it is. And, and just as a bit of background for you, because people tend to get confused about this. When it says that about that day or the hour, nobody knows, not even the son. Uh, people get a bit confused about this because they ask the question, well, Jesus is God. Why doesn't he know the end? Shouldn't he know when the end of the world will be, when the when his eventual second coming will be? He's actually doing something very clever there, Jesus. He isn't saying that he doesn't know when it is or that he doesn't have access to that information. Of course, he's God. Of course, he has access to that information. What he's doing is something very clever. The, he's using the analogy of a wedding. And in the ancient world, in the ancient Jewish world, when there was a wedding, so a couple would get would get um, engaged, the, the groom or the groom-to-be would go away and start making additions to his father's house. You know, in my father's house are many rooms, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back that you may be with me where I am. He's using a wedding example that couples would get engaged and then the, the groom would go away, make preparations, and then what would happen? His father would, if he was in a, a rural area, his father would give him a piece of his land and he'd build a house. If he's in an urban area, he would build another level to the house. And then what, what would he do? He would then come back and get his bride. So remember in the Gospels when Mary and Luke, uh, Mary and Luke, Mary and um and Joseph are engaged to be married, the Bible says that Joseph had in mind to divorce her quietly. He didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. Why would he, he, why is he divorcing her if they're not yet married? Well, it's because an engagement was the same as being married in Jesus' day. They were just waiting for the formal ceremony. Joseph in that time would have been away making additions to his father's house. And one day he would have come back to get Mary. So when Jesus says only the father knows, think about it. In a wedding ceremony, what happens? You're making additions to your father's house. What happens? When the when the when the time is complete, the father will then say to the, his son, the groom, now is the time for you to go get your bride. So the son is doing the work of making the additions, and the father then certifies and says, Everything is done. So what Jesus is saying is that I am the son, I'm building the additions to the house. In my father's house are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In other words, I'm building the additions. I know what's going on. It's the father's right and the father's responsibility to say, go get your bride. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna usurp the father's right. I'm not gonna say with well, the time is to come and collect my bride. He is the father. We know best. And I'm gonna give him the right that belongs to him to tell me when I go and collect my bride. <laughs> And when we read in Acts 1, they ask Jesus this question, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, are you now going to come and judge and be king over the world? And what does Jesus say to them? He says, mind your business. It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power to do what from the Holy Spirit? To be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the earth. So in other words, Jesus settled the debate. So for us as followers of Jesus, why do we need to speculate about the date? Are we, are we the father that we, should, that we should try to say when the return should be? I mean, Jesus said to, the, said to the disciples, mind your business. It's not up to you. It's not your face. Only God, Jesus, only the father will say when the time is. So revelation is not a timeline, friends. It does. It's not. A, it's not a timeline of this is the day when Jesus is going to return. And people have gotten into trouble for trying to make it that. I mean, how many foolish stories have you heard about people who said, "Oh, Jesus is going to return this year. He's going to return in that year." People have done it. 
that's how part of the reason why the Seventh Day Adventist movement started, because people tried to speculate, and when they got it wrong, they had egg on their face. They tried to get numbers in the Bible and try to piece it all together and say, "We know when it is." When Jesus said, "It's not for you to know," and 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 here's the thing: it's not for you to know. What does that mean? If it was for us to know, God would have put it in the Bible somewhere, right? So. What I don't understand is today, why are people trying to get numbers out of the Bible, get things out of the Bible to try to calculate it? Because if it was for us to know, then God would have put it there. Those numbers that people snatch from the book of Daniel, oh, this means this and this and that. If it was for us to know, then God would have put those things there for that purpose. Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Mm. Yep. <clears throat> yep. So when we come back to that first question that we had is, how soon, it doesn't matter how soon. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. We are the bride of Christ. We've been promised that he's going to return to us. All we have to do is make preparations, the preparations from our side. When he's ready, he'll return to us. How many parables, think to the Gospels, how many parables does Jesus tell along these lines? How many does he tell? You know, remember the parable of the ten virgins, those that weren't ready and those that were ready. That's what he's that's what he's telling us. So the book of Revelation, we can we can be free. We don't need to worry about that. And if anybody tries to lead us down this rabbit hole, we can just say to them straight away, no. Our job is to be his witnesses. The father knows, and that's good enough for us. Does anybody know who these these individuals are in this picture or who the guy in the black is in the picture, by the way? No. 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 That is that is uh David Koresh. Oh. Do you, remember, do you remember a few, it was well before my time, but some of you remember, the, you know, the, the, the Waco shootings in, in uh, Texas, yeah. that, the group of yeah. people who, it, th this was the mistake they made. They they try, um, th they tried to think that they could predict the, the when Jesus was going to return. Yeah. This guy tried to sort of set himself up as, 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 as the Messiah. And, and, and what happened? You know, it led to, it led to destruction. And this is, this is the thing that we want to, this is why we have so much controversy when it comes to the book of Revelation. It's because of things like this. But yeah, again, I'll just pause. Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Does that sort of? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Made it very clear. Yes. Now, when we, when we read the book of Revelation, right, the one thing that you'll notice time and time again about the book of Revelation, it says here, can we hope to understand the book of Revelation? This is a great question. Can we hope to understand the book of Revelation? Well, the book of Revelation starts off with these few, th these words. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written because the time is near. You know, if we couldn't understand the book of Revelation, why in the early verses would it say, blessed is the one who understands and takes to heart what is going on, who hears it and understands what's going on? You know, remember the Bible, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Yeah. You know, we always hear the Bible say those things, hear. What does it mean to hear? It means to understand. So, of course, we can understand the book of Revelation. It, it isn't that we're going to understand every single thing. You know, it's impossible to understand every single thing in God's word because we're not God. And no matter how much scholars spend trying to understand um no matter how, many, how, how much scholars try to understand and unpack the book of Revelation or any book of the Bible, whether it's verses or anything like that, we will never understand it in its totality. It is that rich and it is that beautiful because it's a living book. It's God's word is living. <clears throat> so, you know, I think we can have confidence that as we, as we get through the book of Revelation, we are going to understand chunks of it. We're going to understand the big picture of what's going on. And God wanted us to understand it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given it to us. The symbols. In the book of Revelation, there are a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation. So what is going on? Remember, I said the fundamental lesson that we want to take in God's word, the, the three fundamental questions that we ask when we read God's word. Okay. Number one. How would the earliest readers have understood this? Really important. Number two. Are there any other areas of scripture which shed light on this particular verse or this particular passage. Then once we've done those two pieces of work, we then ask the third question. What does it mean for me? What does it mean for me? Right? 
you know the famous story the famous funny story of well it's not funny it's actually serious but the famous story of of you know when judas betrays jesus the verse you know judas went and hung himself you know we read that verse imagine if we just jump to the application first and say you're a person who was going through a difficult time in your life and you you saw that and you jumped to the application first and you thought oh Okay, I'll go and hang myself. I'll go and kill myself, right? How dangerous would that be, right? We always start with the fundamentals. What is what is what is the passage saying to the earliest audience? What is the context? What is all of that stuff? Then number two, are there any other verses which shed light on this particular particular story? You know, that's that's what we've always got to understand. Really, really important. It's it's super important. We make if we don't, we get it, we'll get it wrong. You know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? There are other cities now which have been not other towns and stuff in your parts of the world which have been named Bethlehem because of because of where Jesus was born. Now imagine if you read, Oh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and you thought, Oh, well, Bethlehem might be maybe it's Bethlehem is in the Bethlehem that's in the United States of America. Well, obviously, you and I would say that that's silly. We read the context, we read what it means to the original readers, and then we jump to application. So why is this important? It's important because in the book of Revelation, there are a lot of vivid sim symbols, a lot of vivid images, and a lot of vivid me metaphors. For us to understand them, we have to first understand what they meant to the original audience, not to jump to conclusions and assume that they mean something for us today. Time and time again, and, and maybe this frustrates you, it frustrates me, we hear people interpret symbols in the book of Revelation and say, oh, that must mean um, that that must mean um, that that it's this or it's that. Yeah. Yeah. John, John just didn't know what he was describing. John just didn't know what he was screaming, what he was seeing. So he, he just described as best as he could. And those are symbols of, of things today in, in, in our lives. Well, well, no, the, the Australian, the, the people in John's day recognized these symbols. You know, people often say, oh, you know, in Revelation 9, when it talks about, you know, the plague of locusts, you know, John was, he couldn't quite, he didn't know what to put in words, but what he was really seeing was like a modern helicopter. You know, imagine, imagine he's really just seeing a, a modern helicopter and he didn't know what it was because there were no helicopters in his day. And and we know what a helicopter is today. And, and what John is saying is it's about wars and it's about, you know, Russia's, uh, you know, invasion of Ukraine or, or, or the war in Iraq or the second world war because there are helicopters and all these sorts of things. You know, no, that's, that's not correct. Or, or people have said, oh, no, no, well, 666, the mark of the beast must be bank card. As you can sort of see in, in bank card or, or B pay rather, you know, you sort of like you can sort of see like a, a couple of sixes there. You got the you got, you got the sort of shape of these sixes. If you look at the, the B pay logo, it's got like a couple of different. It's got like three sixes, and people have said, "Oh, you know, six 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 is 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 this? It's 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 the mark of it's it's B pay. You know, you can't you can't do that. You know, would if the original audience didn't know what these things are, then obviously that's not what John meant. And I'm going to tell you. Especially when we get to, to it will either be tomorrow or it'll be next week. Depends how fast we move to the rest of chapter chapter one. But the symbols that are that are really there in 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 um, chapter one, and you're going to discover really really quickly that when we understand the ancient world, these symbols make sense really quickly. So we don't need to we don't need to bring in the modern world. Let's first understand how the ancient world understood these things. And the ancient world understood these symbols clearly. It would have taken John's audience five minutes, five minutes to understand what 666 was. There was no debate. There was no surprise. And when we get to that, I'll explain why. They knew it. They understood it. They knew how to calculate it. 666 was a reference to Nero. Um, it was a, a game that they used to play. It was something called Gematria. When we get to it, it'll make sense. We don't need to, to invent modern. People have invented all sorts of modern things. Oh, 666 could be Microsoft. It could be Bill Gates. It could be this person or that person. It's not. You know, we, we, we've, got to, we've got to understand that. We've got to get that, that fundamentally right. You know what I mean? Um, as an example, right, we, we know that there are there are six stars on the, on the um, Australian flag, six stars. On the, the book of Revelation talks about seven stars, right? Now, imagine... People thinking that, oh, you know, the six, the seven stars in the book of Revelation was a reference to, 
oh, maybe it's a reference to Australia because they've got like six stars on their flag or, you know, let's find a country which has seven stars on their flag and let's see if we can, you know, we can, we can uh, you know, go from there. No, that, that's silly, isn't it? That's, that's not right. What do these signs and these symbols mean to the, the first hearers? And then we'll understand what they actually mean. And guy, I'm going to be honest with you, it would have taken them a few seconds to figure out what these star signs and these symbols meant. A few, a few seconds. The book of Revelation uses a lot of numbers and a lot of images. It uses a lot of images like the seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven blessings, seven stars, seven angels, 666. Today, people try to interpret them in light of all sorts of things going on in the world, et cetera, et cetera. No. The ancient world, the first readers, they knew what the seven trumpets were. They knew what the seven seals were. They knew what the seven blessings were. They knew what the seven bowls were. They knew all of those things because the images were images in their day. It's like if the book of Revelation was to be used, if the book of Revelation was to be written today and the author employed things like you know, cell phones or different companies' logos like the M of McDonald's or Apple's, you know, half and Apple or Microsoft's Windows or all those sorts of things. We would know what those symbols meant and the early church knew what those symbols meant also. So, you know, that's 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 something that I want to really convey. I want, I want to really press that notion that that as we read this book, we're going to, we're going to know and try to unpack what the early church would have understood about these symbols. Just one quick example. The book of Revelation talks about seven seals. Okay. You and I might turn around today and think that if we're in misinterpreting the book of Revelation, we might say, oh, well, America has Navy seals. So maybe the book of Revelation is talking about seven Navy seals that will spring up and, and this will be, you know, what's going to happen. You know, well, that's foolish. How would the early church have understood that? Well, in the ancient world, when you wrote a will, when you wrote a will, when a, when a tester wrote a will, what would that, what would the tester do or the person writing the will do? They would seal it up and they would have seven witnesses seal it with a stamp, seal it with a stamp. And then at that person's death, it could then be opened up by the witnesses. What was the point of it? The point was to stop people from misunderstanding it, what's going on. So the New Testament is called the New Testament for a reason. It is the testament of Jesus. What did Jesus say? I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send you what? I will send you the Spirit. And what has the Spirit done? The Spirit has sealed us. Why? The Spirit was the guarantor making sure that after Jesus left this earth, that nobody would misinterpret or misconvey his message. And that's why the Spirit inspired the gospel writers to write down the gospels. And, and what did Jesus say? That when the Spirit comes, when the advocate comes, he will bring to mind and he will remind you of all the things that I have taught you. For what reason? So that my testament, my will, after I'm gone, can be read aloud to the world and it will be effective that nobody can nobody can misunderstand. Does it does it make sense? What I'm mm. saying? That that's mm. Yes, These images, yes, as we read the book of Revelations, will make sense as we interpret them. Same with the numbers. John employs a lot of numerology. Apocalyptic literature was synonymous for this. Synonymous. Seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven blessings, seven stars, seven angels, 666. Employs a lot of these things. And we'll unpack, unpack them as we go along. Um, let me let me pause here. Okay, any questions or any, any comments that people want to make? No. Okay. All good. Sorry if my slides are a little bit out of order. I I um rearranged them so that next well tomorrow's lesson we can do a bit of a review of some of the stuff. That's why they're a bit out of order. Um, the encore was something that came after I had edited my slides. That's why I'm jumping around a bit, and that's why this slide here says "Welcome to Week Two" pretty much. Um, but anyway, um, okay, so. Oh, sorry. This was the map I was trying to show earlier. So um, you can see this. Can you see these, these were like the Roman provinces. Uh, you can see Galatia, Book of Galatians was to that region there. Um, Thessalonica is here. There were all these regions that the Roman Empire was divided into. You can't see it, but can you see next to Asia? I'm sorry for people with, with lower visibility, but can you see how here we've got Judea? Judea? That's obviously uh, where Jesus was from, the land of Judea. 
Um, that was the region that Jesus was from. Uh, eventually, the Romans just got rid of it completely because the Jews were revolting too much. They burnt the temple, and then it got the region just got merged with um, with um, Syria. But Herod, king of the Jews, Herod, king of Judea, he was the king of this region, this particular province. Pontius Pilate became governor of Judea. Do you notice that? So, so, so Asia Minor, Asia Minor was the region, and this is the region, these churches on the coastline. You can go to modern Turkey. Um, you can go there to modern Turkey. Um, uh, in a, if you want, as a bit of a study, and you can visit some of these places, they're still there, those seven churches, the regions are still there. Um, hopefully, I, I'm not made any guarantees, but it's, it's I'm hoping um, in 2025, probably at the start of 2025, I'm hoping to lead a tour of people from our church over to Israel and Jordan. So if you're a person who likes to travel and you can save up, you know, keep in mind that we'll try to do that. If it's if it's going to happen, I'll know early next year and I'll I'll set the dates for everybody. Um, but but so it's coming to Asia Minor. These are where the churches are. Who wrote Revelation? Because that's 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 a that's a really oh. important question. Just want to pause. How is everybody tracking? Is I don't want it to be information overload or anything like that. Like I said, just the first couple of weeks will be a bit more intense, and then after that we'll slow down the pace. But just is everybody sort of um, tracking with me so far? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, in, in, not, not immediately, but in weeks to come, I'll, I'll send out um, copies of some of my, my notes and like, well, this PowerPoint presentation. And sometimes I'll have notes, which I'll send out. Um, last year when I used to do Parkside Thursdays for the most, I didn't really, I just used to present. I never really used to have PowerPoints or anything like that, but people did say it was very helpful. So I'm trying to keep that up but every week i may not be able to have a powerpoint because it obviously takes time to prepare but i'm trying my best okay so we know in uh, matthew's gospel would somebody just like to read that that passage that's on the screen it's a it's a it's a verse from um matthew's gospel would somebody like to read it for us jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease in sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. John was a very common name in Jesus's in Jesus's world. I, I hope Jesus was a very common name. The most common boy's name in Jesus's day was Simon or Simeon or one of the derivatives. The most common girl's name in Jesus's day was Miriam, Mary or Miriam, one of the derivatives. Why? Because these were Old Testament names. John was a common name. Joseph, a very common name. Think about Joseph in Genesis. Uh, all really, really common names. Uh, so there was a lot of Johns. Okay. So the most the most likely explanation is that this is John, the disciple of Jesus, the disciple of Jesus. Um, but we have to be open to the possibility that it could have been another John because it was just that common of a name. Um, the early church seems to be pretty unanimous that it was this. And um, for that reason, most scholars tend to, tend to accept that because at the end of the day, the early church are the closest people to this time. You have people like um, Justin Marta, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement, or Origen. These were the earliest guys, um, the earliest students, I guess, the early church fathers. So they have a better idea than than we do because they were close and they were aware of these communities. Um, some of them uh, were even disciples of Jesus's um, early disciples. So like John taught disciples and then they taught them. So some of them, the chain of succession is not that far down the line. So, so most people are pretty confident with it. Um, later Christians have proposed the, the, the possibility that it was a different John, somebody called John the Elder. Um, so we're open to that possibility, but the most likely, the best evidence we have is that it was John the disciple. Now, is this the same John who wrote the Gospel of John and the three letters of John? We'll know in the Bible there's the Gospel of John uh, or the Gospel according to John, and then there's First John, Second John, Third John, and then there's Revelation. So is this the same John who wrote this? Um it's debatable. 
Uh, there's a lot of debate around around that. Some people think that the Greek grammar and the Greek style of Revelation is so different from the Gospel of John that it's probably that they they say, well, no, it's got to be somebody else who's written it. Um, that argument is not completely pers uh, persuasive. So yes, the grammar of Revelation is very very different. It's very very uh, starkly different. But there's logic behind that. Revelation is apocalyptic literature. So naturally, it's going to be very, very different to that. But people say, "Oh, yeah, but the penmanship, the style, the grammar, the the, the, gram the grammar, the grammar, the grammar, sentence structures, and all those stuff is different." But the reason and the rationale could be that at the end of the day, scribes were extremely common in the ancient world. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Paul—they all employed scribes. All ancient people did it. It was it was a an occupation. You know how like you go to a, a lawyer today, who a lawyer who will draft statements for people now if you have an issue and you go to a lawyer and that lawyer might that lawyer might draft your statement right they take your words and they craft it into a legal statement well that was common in the ancient world that all these communities had scribes who did that some of the books of the bible tell us who the scribes are for instance romans tells us who the scribe is who wrote it down so that's what happened that these guys would have articulated to their scribes what they wanted and their scribes would have wrote it down so what I think is a likely explanation is that John is exiled on Patmos. So the secretary of the scribe he used is probably a different secretary of scribe that he used when he was writing his gospel because the scribe wouldn't have been exiled with him. So that's probably the reason why there's a difference. But one of the strongest reasons why we can be confident that it is there's probably the same John who wrote this across is because there's a lot of similar patterns. So as I said, remember I said just now, you know, there's Revelation has a lot of repeated patterns, you know, um, you know, seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven blessings, seven stars, seven angels, all of those things. Well, John's gospel, if you read it, it has a lot of common meta common numerical functions. Uh, John's gospel, he's got the seven signs in his gospel. He's got the seven I am statements. If you remember, what are the seven signs in John's gospel? I'm not going to do a good job remembering them off the top of my head, but you've got like, he changes water into wine. He heals the paralyzed man. He walks on water. He multiplies bread. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He heals. Um, I think he heals the official son. Um, ooh, terrible. Jason, you're fired. There's one other I, I can't remember. Um, but, but you say. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. He calls. Oh, wow, gold star. Yes, he causes. He 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 opens the eyes of one of the blind. Uh, of, he heals the blind man of sight, and they interrogate him after that. So he has the seven the seven signs of John. There's actually more than seven signs because there's also the resurrection and the great catch. But the seven signs is what the ministry of Jesus is orientated around. Um, we have the seven I am statements. You know, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of life. I am the true vine. I I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, I'm the good shepherd. There's two others there. So we've 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 got those um the seven signs. So that's why most people, when we look at the early church witness and we look at those those similarities, most will tend to agree that it, it was John, one of his disciples, one of the eyewitnesses. That's the that's the stance I'm gonna take. But like I said, it's a possibility that it's somebody else. We just don't have any good evidence to suggest it's somebody else. So that's that's great. So we'll when was Revelation written? Look, there's two possibilities. A um, couple of other minor possibilities. Some of uh, people have speculated earlier, later dates. There's a couple of uh, major possibilities. Two main possibilities are that it was in the mid 60s um, when during the reign of Emperor Nero. Like I said, 666 refers to Emperor Nero. There's no way around that. And when we get to that, we'll see there's multiple reasons why that, why it's, it's Emperor Nero and no one else. Um, uh, there was a brief but intensive persecution. Um, of Christians in 64 AD. Uh, you'll remember uh, this week at church, if you were there, I told a story about how there was a fire in Rome in 64 AD. Uh, mm -hmm. Nero was a madman. He was paranoid. He executed a lot of people, including close relatives. Um, and eventually he himself was executed. And then there was just turmoil in the Roman Empire at this time. Uh, but in, in 64 AD, there was uh, the city of Rome was burnt. Over 70% of it was destroyed. Um, most people speculated that it was most people tend, you know, in politics when there's a bit of a, a cover up or there's a bit of a stink, people sort of, you know, people sort of figure it out very quickly that the story doesn't make sense. Well, Nero at this time was 
um, building. He had plans for a new city called Neropolis, Neropolis, which which he wanted to build. So people sort of caught on at the fact that no, nah, there's something off here, and and Nero trying to avoid blame, he he fastened the blame on the Christians. None of this information is in the New Testament. This is information that other historians of the day, like Tacitus, record for us. He fastened the blame on the Christians. People hated the Christians at this time. They they were at loggerheads with the Jews because the Jews rejected the Messiah. So there was a lot of issues there and they were preaching um, just Jesus Christ. So they didn't really, Jews didn't really like them. And a lot of them were coming to Christ at this time. Uh, the gent the pagans hated the Christians because they weren't sacrificing to idols and things like that. They weren't worshiping the empire. So everybody really hated the Christians. So Nero fastened the blame on the Christians in Rome. And there was an intense persecution uh, at this particular time. Uh, most likely around this time, Paul was killed, uh, beheaded. Peter was crucified around this time as well. So, a lot of significance, a lot of significant issues, which is why, you know, the book of Revelation talks about a lot of real suffering that's coming upon the church. You imagine if you're in this in these small local house churches and leaders are being executed and the like, it's going to be pretty intense for you and your churches at this time. Uh, the other possibility, now the main possibility that is that is that is put forward is that the book of Revelation was written in the mid-90s. This is the main um the main most scholars hold to this view. Uh, in the white down the bottom, I say there are some um, earlier and later dates that people do take from that. Look, um, around the mid nineties, there was another small, there was another short but intense persecution of Christians. This was more widespread uh, at this time. It was under Emperor Domitian who executed a lot of Christians. This is the around the time that the Colosseum had been built, so it's the time that they started getting thrown to lions and executed in the gladiatorial arena, those sorts of things. So most tend to take the second date. I, I'm neutral on this particular point. For a long time, I just assumed the 90s, that the mid-90s date, the date, though a lot of strong um reasons have been put to me recently by some of the people that I'm that I'm been listening to and reading to prepare for this. Um, so I, I'm agnostic to the question. It could be either or I lean towards the mid 90s. Though I'm open to either one, uh, whichever one you take doesn't matter. You're free to make that decision um, yourself. Uh, any any questions people have at this time? Oh, all good. Yeah. Uh, this this slide here that I've got on screen just has a loose uh, the, the 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 generally accepted debates that people believe when certain books in the Old Testament was written. There's 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 debate. You know what I mean? There's not not everything is is uniform, but most tend to fall in this. And there's good reasons to support all of these things. You know, Paul's writing his letters around the mid fifties, early sixties. Um, you know, the gospel sort of come. You know, in this after the seventies, about forty years after the life of Jesus, um, and then Revelation then comes sort of at the back end in the nineties. So if you take an early date, it would then put the Book of Revelation around the time that the epistles are being written, and even maybe potentially before the gospels are written. There's good reasons, right? Like I said, I, I accept the general chronology because to me it doesn't matter that much, but there's good reasons. You know, the Gospels could have been written earlier than even the, the 70s AD. There's um, debate about all this sort of stuff. So, you know, I'm I'm personally open to all sorts of debate. There are, there are atheist scholars who would debate, who will, who, will, um, who will date Mark's Gospel even in the 50s, and they're not Christians and they'll do it. These dates are what the generally accepted dates are, um, just, just so you know. So um, if, if Revelation is in there, this is just to give you a bit of a snapshot as to what's sort of going on at this time in the formation of Christian Christian Christianity as a movement. It's also the, the pulling together of now the New Testament, the historical documents. And, and um, in terms of historicity, the Gospels are written very, very early and they give us really accurate historical information, which is, uh, why I'm a Christian today. Uh, you know, any, any questions there or any statements that people want to make? No. All right. No, Just the final thing that I, I want to make, and, and we'll leave it, we'll leave it there. Um the Old Testament and Revelation. There are over 400 verses in the in the book of Revelation. So you imagine if I've got through four tonight and I get through that that rate. Jesus will return before we get through this book. You know what I mean? Yep. So uh, we'll move a bit faster, but there are over 400 verses in the book of Revelation and there are over 500 Old Testament allusions and references. That's a lot. That is a lot. Um, 
what this teaches us is that scripture is the key to understanding the book of revelation it isn't actually modern events that are going on this in this world so you know how people have things like oh you know um this political thing is happening and that is a sign of the end times you know they're building the new temple they're getting this ready they're getting that ready and all that sort of stuff no actually scripture is the key to understanding scripture we understand our Old Testament well. We'll understand the book of Revelation well because there's over 500 Old Testament references. And you think about it, if there's a tick over 400 verses in the book of Revelation and there's over 500 references, what does that mean? There's at least one reference to the Old Testament in each verse, you know, because there's just that many. Exodus is an important story. Um, remember that, until the death and resurrection of Jesus, what was the most important story the people of God had? It was the Exodus story in the Old Testament. It was the story that here we had a wicked and immoral Egyptian pharaoh and empire who had enslaved God's people. And what happened? God kicked his butt and freed his people. So what is the book of Revelation doing? Remember, I said it, it's telling the story of God's victory from two perspectives, from a heavenly perspective and an earthly perspective. Here's Satan and the forces of darkness which have which have tried to ensnare God's people. And what happens? Christ at the cross has kicked their butts. What's happening today? Nero and the Roman Empire, the new Babylon, is trying to ensnare God's people. It's persecuting them. It's putting them to death. It's executing them. And what's happened? God's going to kick their butts again, just like he's always done. That's – sorry if my language is a bit crude there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but but, but – you get what I mean? So I Revelation it. Revelation borrows a lot of the Exodus story. The Gospels borrow a lot of the Exodus story. When we look at the life of Jesus, what is what happens? It's told through the lens of the Exodus story. What does Jesus do? He gives a sermon on the mount. Who gave who went to the mountaintop in the exit in the book of Exodus and got the God's law? Moses. Moses. Did Jesus do? Same thing. He, he on the mountain where God gave the law to Moses to give to the people, God now gives the law to the people directly himself. Matthew's gospel, Jesus's teachings are, are, are structured in five sections. Five sections. How many books were there to the Torah, to the Old Testament? Five sections. Jesus baptized in the Jordan River. The heavens part. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. What happened in there? The book of Exodus, the people of God go into the oceans, the sea of the Red Sea is parted. That's their baptism. What happens in the wilderness? Tested three times. People of God fail each time they're tested. They build a golden calf. They put the Lord their God to the test. What happens to Jesus after being baptized? Goes into the wilderness. Satan tries to tempt him three times. Each time he passes the test. Jesus is the new Israel. So the Exodus story is being told in the Gospels over and over again. What is being told in the book of Revelation? Jesus is leading a new Exodus. He's leading a new humanity. And what happens at the when we looked at the resurrection, we talked about this. What does Jesus do? Jesus raised from the dead, go forth, make disciples of all nations. What is he doing? He's recreating humanity in his own image. What happened in Genesis? God creates the world, creates mankind what? In his own image and says, do what? Go and be fruitful. What is Jesus doing in the Great Commission? Building the new temple of God. Doing what? Making disciples who are then called to do what? Like Adam and Eve, go and be fruitful. Go and multiply more disciples. So the book of Revelation is borrowing a lot from the Old Testament image and the Old Testament imagery. <laughs> John's Gospel, what what took up a chunk of time in the in the Old Testament? God's people wanting to build what a temple. What does Jesus say in the New Testament in John's Gospel? Destroy this temple. I will rebuild it in three days. Why? Because He's the temple. So the old the New Testament is borrowing a lot from the Old Testament, and the Book of Revelation does that a lot as well. And I'm mindful that we've hit our uh, nine thirty deadline as well. So uh, just. Any questions, any comments that people want to make this time?